great moments in history where you had collaboration. Think about Mozart, Haydn, and Baron von Swieten working on reviving the work of Bach, and I'll talk about that later. Geniuses who collaborated to improve humanity. Think about Schiller, Friedrich Schiller, and Goethe, and the von Humboldt brothers, four universal geniuses. In the case of Goethe, some, sometimes a little bit corrupted. But around Schiller, he was made better. You, it'd be pretty hard to be a, a corrupt degenerate around Schiller. <laughs> and he brought out, as Helga always said, the best in Goethe. You know, there's a famous story about Beethoven and Goethe. They were out in the street, and the Grand Duke rode by in a carriage. And Beethoven just stood there like this, and Goethe did a big bow. <laughs> and Goethe looked at Beethoven, and Beethoven walked away in disgust. <laughs> um, but around Schiller, Goethe was better. And, and Goethe himself said it. He said, after Schiller died, some of me died. Mm. Think of the founding fathers who drafted the Constitution, a group of geniuses who were steeped in Plato and had read the great works of, of government before they put together their uh, work with the Declaration <coughs> of Independence and the Constitution. They were studying Leibniz at the, con at the Demo Declaration of Independence Convention. Franklin handed out a book by Emmerich de Fadel, who was the prime student of Leibniz and who wrote a book that uh, went through a great deal of material on Leibniz's idea of what? Pursuit of happiness, spiritual development as opposed to material and property. So I was saying to our, our colleagues, look at what you guys have. We don't just have two or three people. We have a potential of a couple hundred young people who can collaborate and work together on the greatest, most profound ideas, taking up the deepest, most vexing problems of mankind, solving global hunger, ending injustice, developing economies that are human, exploring space. You know, these are the kinds of things before you. So what do we have to look back to? And I, I want to present just a couple of case studies that give some ideas of, uh, uh, particularly from the standpoint of music, but I actually want to start with Kepler, because what I want to talk about is the relationship between Bach's B minor mass and Mozart's mass in C, which you're singing, and which you sang very well today, the, the section that you presented. But there's an interesting part to this, and this is what I want to get at, because this is, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm not trying to recruit anybody to Christianity. If anything, I'm more, I have more tendency to be a rabbi <laughs> than a, an evangelistic Christian minister. But I want to take a look at the higher questions of, of theology from the standpoint of great thinkers who were profoundly religious. Not like Jimmy Swagger or... Rick Warren from the Saddleback Church, <laughs> or anything of these guys, but profoundly religious in the sense that they were looking for the coherence between man and God. They were looking for some kind of connection with the universal, with the eternal, a purpose of life. Now, here's an interesting point. But let's take a look at it from the following standpoint. First of all, let me just ask, how many people here attended church regularly growing up, just, just so I have an idea. Cool. Really? Wow. wow. All right, how many of you believed anything you heard in the church? <laughs> All right. And how many were Catholic? How many people went to Catholic? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this is a little better. Now, you see, I, I'll, be, I'll, I'll, I'll confess right up front. <laughs> I was bar mitzvahed. I was somewhat of a secular Jew. I was from a, my grandparents were Orthodox Jews. My parents were Reformed Jews, and I like bagels and locks. <laughs> so there's a shift in what you might call assimilation. But I, I took I took it seriously. But when I joined the organization and ran in the Larouche, I, I found that Lynn had a kind of spirituality, a kind of religious view that wasn't connected to any denomination and was not rule-driven. 
but was based on an investigation of the most profound questions. Now, most of you probably know that today, people who consider themselves scientists are largely not religious. Part of this is, where is science going today? Chaos theory, quantum theory, entropy. The idea that everything's winding down and that things are chaotic and there's no coherence in the physical universe. The Big Bang Theory. And so when you have things like that, or the, you know, the whole connection of these things to such ideas as black holes, and right now the biggest black hole is the debt. <laughs> but this idea that people have today of religion is either ignorant fundamentalism there are some people who have good, who want to believe in the goodness of man and, and look to religion for that, but a lot of people who are agnostics or atheists, especially in science. Now, just go back a hundred years to Einstein. What did Einstein say? God does not play dice with the universe, meaning there is some kind of higher order, some coherence, some primary cause that we should be searching for to discover what, how does this all make sense. Now then you go back to the beginnings of the modern era. Cusa. Cusa was the founder of modern science. And what was he? He was a cardinal, a bishop and then a cardinal in the Catholic Church. And if you read his writings, they're very theological, but also very rigorously scientific. And I want to talk about Kepler a little bit, because Kepler in his pursuit of the ordering principles behind the planetary orbits was also highly rigorous, but at the same time, and scientific. He, did, he really advanced modern science. But Kepler also was profoundly religious. And then I want to look at, at from that standpoint, at Bach and Mozart. So that's basically what I'm going to cover. Now, the Kepler question to me is, is fascinating because I, as you probably know, Mihua and I have been working on uh, a lot of things over the years. A lot of it has, has to do with the Mozart-Bach collaboration. That's where it started. Mm -hmm. And you know, recently she's been kicking my butt telling me, you got to get to Kepler. you got to go back to Kepler. Of course, Lynn's doing the same thing. Book four. <laughs> you haven't read book four yet? Get out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite, but, uh, so I, I decided I was going to ease my way into it again and, and see what I could discover on this Kepler question. And what I found fascinating was that Kepler lived in a moment of incredible religious turmoil. Uh, he was born in 1571, and as he was growing up, he was surrounded by, on the one hand, the Reformation, which had two primary movements, the Lutheran Church and the Calvinist Church. And then the third movement was the one they were both attacking, the Catholic Church. And then at a certain point, as the Reformation started growing in power, the Catholic Church, through the Jesuits, launched a counter-reformation. Now, people died over issues such as, is the wafer in communion? the literal body of Christ or wafer that was permeated with the spirit of Christ. If you had the wrong answer, you could get killed. There were religious wars, literally from 1492 to 1648, but the big one in Kepler's life was 1618 to 1648. It was called the Thirty Years' War. It started with one of my favorite events in history, the defenestration of Prague. <laughs> and defenestration is a fancy word for being thrown out the window. <laughs> and it, it occurred when the Catholic tax collector came to Prague to collect the taxes, and they threw him out the window. And that led to a new 30 years war, but it was embedded within this much longer period. Now, here's the interesting thing on this. Here you have Kepler who's engaged in an incredible lifetime of investigation of astronomical sightings and making sense of the stars and the heavens, and whose work we, we've all been working on over, the, especially the youth movement, going through the originally the new astronomy and now the work on the, the harmonies of the world. 
the world harmonies. You know, where he shows the coherence of, of various kinds of physical processes. And he shows that you have to go beyond the senses. You can't trust what you see or what you hear, but you have to develop hypotheses. That you can use sightings and things of that sort. And he was quite meticulous in doing the tables for the Emperor Rudolph. But more importantly, was that he was committed to truth. Now, what happened to him in his lifetime? In 1600, he was in the town of Graz in Austria, which was at the time run by the Catholic Church. And everybody who wanted to work in the university was brought in for an examination, and they were asked one question. Are you a Catholic? And if the answer was no, there was a second question. Are you prepared, prepared to convert to Catholicism? <laughs> and if you said no, you had to leave. Kepler could have converted to Catholicism because he liked what he was doing there. But he had to tell the truth. He said he's not a Catholic. And he left. Then later on he ended up in Linz, another Austrian town run by the Lutherans. Now Kepler was a Lutheran. I'm not going to go through the difference, but the, the main thing, Calvinists believed in predestination. Luther didn't accept that. The idea that when you were born it was determined whether you were going to be saved or not by God. You had nothing to do with it. There was nothing you could do in your life to do, to, to if you weren't one of the chosen, forget it. But the other point to it was if you were one of the chosen, you probably would do good things and you would prosper. It's basically Calvinism. And Kepler liked elements of the Calvinist theology, but he didn't accept predestination. As far as the Catholic Church, he didn't like the idea that you had to go through a church hierarchy. He called it the papist religion. Why was it that for me to get close to God as a Catholic, I have to go through the bishop, and then the cardinal, and then the pope? That there's an intercessor, there's a... And he liked the idea of the church being timeless, and existing for a purpose, and having a history to it. But he didn't like the idea of going through the pope. Now, he had a problem with the Lutherans also. Mm -hmm. Because the thing he didn't like about Lutheranism was the difference between the Catholics and the Lutherans on the question of the Eucharist, the communion. Because the Catholic view is that the wafer is the, the flesh, the actual flesh of Jesus through the service. And the wine is the blood. And the Lutherans said, no, the bread gets basically permeated by the substance of the spirit of Christ. Again, you got killed over these differences. Now, Kepler said he could find no existing proof in uh, the old teachings of the Bible from the prophets and anyone else, the apostles, to back up this theory which they called ubiquity, that the spirit of Christ is everywhere and permeates everything, including the wafer. And so... He was asked, to before he could take communion, do you accept this idea of ubiquity? And he said no. And so they kicked him out of the Lutheran church. And he had a back and forth debate. And I just want to read you a couple of the things that he said on this, because this comes back to one of the most important principles. And again, this is, these are, I'm giving you the religious battles over it, but think bigger, because I'll come to this in just a moment, what the real implications of this are. It, or are. The idea of consubstantiation, the idea which is Im embedded in the concept of incarnation, that Jesus was both man and God. Now, what's the implication of that? The implication is that man can participate in the divine, that we're not God per se, we're human, but we can aspire to the qualities of the divine through imitation of Christ. Which means, what? That we can walk on water and fast and resist the devil and make <laughs> loaves of bread and fishes and turn water into wine and things like that? No. What's the actual nature of the divine for the great thinkers of the church and people like Kepler? It's the capacity of the human mind to take up the mysteries of human life and creation. 
and to act in imitation of the creator through mastering the principles, the, the universal principles, the causes of physical events, and use that knowledge to better the conditions of man. That's what it means to someone like Kepler. Why, why study the uh, astronomical tables and the, the planetary orbits? To win a prize? To become famous and make money? No, it's, it's to get at the truth which will help man understand where we are in the cosmos. And so Kepler was rigorously, ruthlessly committed to truth. So they said to him, can't you just accept this idea of the ubiquity so we can give you communion? We don't want to expel you from the church. You're a valued member of the community, except for your stubbornness. <laughs> and Kepler said that there's no way he could do that. And so he was banished. Now, Kepler was a theologian before he was studying theology before he went into mathematics and astronomy. And he had a problem with this. He said, if you have freedom of conscience, which the Lutherans said you have to give a certain amount of freedom to people, but the idea was the freedom will direct you to God. But Kepler said, if you give people that individual conscience, that is, you don't have to go through a priest or someone higher up, it, that everybody has a certain priest quality, then why can't you allow complete freedom of conscience? And if there's no freedom of conscience, if you have to accept the, the re religion of the ruler, then how is that real freedom? And he said he was confronted with religious teachers who interpreted holy writ according to rigid rules. And he said he had doubts about all these things, and he said, look, why can't these things be approached scientifically? Now, on this battle he had in the church, I'm just going to give you some quotes from him, because you'll see how important it is that a guy who was a theologian and a, an astronomer made an accurate forecast about what was coming in Germany because of the idiocy and inflexibility of, these, of religious dogma. Um, essentially, they said to Kepler, concentrate on mathematics and stay away from theology. And this is a quote from what the religious authorities wrote to him in response to his appeal to be accepted. He wrote, or they wrote to him, don't trust your own inspiration too much. And see to it that your faith rests not on the wisdom of man, but on the strength of God. Now, if you're Kepler, that's a challenge. He was not going to turn away from that. Because the idea that the wisdom of man is separate from God, and you have to bow to the will of God. So Kepler wrote a response to that. He said, I've been denounced as unprincipled, agreeing with all, prompted not by a sincere heart, but by a desire to obtain the goodwill of all parties. And he said that because he, he told them he believed all three factions had some legitimacy to them. But by doing that, I've been denounced as a doubter, who at his advanced age has not yet found a basis for his faith. I've been denounced as unstable, now siding with one, now another. Mm -hmm according as something new and unusual is brought into the arena. And he said, it's annoying to be told that I'm so bold and proud and puffed up as not to agree with any party. But I bear witness before God that I am not pleased nor satisfied in this role, nor do I like to be considered as a man apart. It hurts my heart that the three great factions have, been, have torn the truth so miserably that I must collect it piece by piece, wherever I find a piece. And he says, I have no regrets, however. Now he went on to say that he said he's approaching this as a Christian. And he said, what the imagination of the others is, I do not know. God already has rewarded the quarreling, quarreling Germany with tribulations. This was, I think, 1615. He was forecasting what became the Thirty Years' War, that if you keep this up, there will be more tribulations. And uh, he said, I tie myself to all simple Christians, whatever they are called, with a Christian bond of love. I am an enemy of all misinterpretation and speak well wherever I can. 
And finally, he said, I could quell this whole fight. In other words, he could be accepted in the church by subscribing unreservedly to the formula of concord of the Lutheran church. Yet I have no right to be hypocritical in matters of conscience. I'm ready to sign if the reservations I have already presented are accepted. I want no share in the anger of the theologians. I shall not judge brothers. For whether they stand or fall, they are my brothers and those of the Lord. Since I'm not a teacher of the church, it is better for me to pardon, report good, and interpret favorably than to indict, vilify, and distort. Now, his idea was Cruz's idea. You just told me you were reading the piece of the faith, right? Oh, okay, the Pache. Well, Cusa had this idea uh, a couple hundred years earlier about why couldn't people sit down and reason this out and realize that it's the same universe. So the the idea that someone approaches it this way or that way uh, is not a cause for killing, nor should it diminish your faith. But the question is, if there's a higher principle that's discernible, that it should, your faith should be in coherence with those principles. And that's what Kepler was fighting for in his scientific approach, as well as in the battle for uh, improvement of the human condition. And he said, in these times, the theologians only want to have good German hirelings in matters of creed because one takes money from a single lord and for him risks life and limb. By lord he means local nobleman. And does not worry much whether he is right or wrong. And where you live determined which branch you have. If you lived in southern Germany, you better be a Catholic during the Thirty Years' War uh, or you could get killed. If you lived in northern Germany, there, there was a fight between the Lutherans and the Calvinists. And you had all these battles going, which nearly destroyed Germany. And I think Kepler's view on this reflects a desire to bring his view into coherence with these physical processes, which were discernible by the mind of man. Now, what's interesting to me, then, is you take a look at someone who was very influenced by Kepler's work. And that's Johann Sebastian Bach. Now, Bach was a musician who was also very religious. Bach was a Protestant and spent a lot... What what are the big differences between the Protestants and the Catholics? was also this question of of the the large uh, congregations who participated in the Mass. And because of the living through the story of the life of Jesus with the priest by receiving communion, would be participating somehow in the divine. Whereas the Protestants believed, the Lutherans believed, that there had to be an individual emotional connection with God. But it was still rule-driven. Now, you have Kepler, who, as I said, disagreed with parts of all three. Bach was a very interesting case, because Bach wrote all sorts of Lutheran hymns, cantatas, those of you who have sung some of the Bach songs, whether, whether it's uh, 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 Bach et Auf, uh, the, mm-hmm. or the Asia, yeah, mm-hmm. you, you know that in Bach's music, he's very reverential, very serious. But all of a sudden, near the end of his life, Bach puts together a huge mass, a Catholic mass, the mass in B minor. <laughs> and it's interesting Because he took, because what he reflected in this was the same thing as Kepler, that there's a universality to the Christian belief that goes back to the beginning, to the mission of Jesus, the mission of Jesus Christ. And there's a conception of God which flows from that, but what was it that Bach was thinking? How do you get it from his music, what he was thinking about these things? What, what he reflects was the same idea as Kepler, which is through your search for truth, you're seeking these higher principles. You're, in fact, exemplifying the creativity, 
that man has as, as being human. But there's one step further, which actually is there with Kepler, but is, is definitely there with Bach. It's your responsibility as someone who's developed, someone who's taken these ideas seriously and worked them through, in the case of Kepler, scientifically, in the case of Bach with music, to take these ideas to the population. These guys were missionaries. They wanted to fight superstition and stupidity. You know, in, in Kepler, there's this, this one great quote. I, I can't remember it exactly. I said it to you a while back. Where Kepler's talking about this question of uh, astrology. Because he was also very interested in the astrological tables. And, and he said, it's obvious that the, the location of the stars in the sky have an effect on human life. He said, however, a weaker army won't defeat a more powerful one based on the stars. <laughs> so it's this idea that I want to do what's right by God, but through my right arm. And this idea that you have to develop yourself. You have to become a better, more powerful fighter for truth. And this is what Bach did with his music. Now, what Bach did in the B minor mass was, was really quite fascinating and you know I, I wish I had two hours for us to listen to it <laughs> because it's it, actually the best way to do it forget CDs or anything like that someone somewhere has to be performing this at some time in the next year and it, it's important to see it live because it's, it's incredibly powerful but what Bach does with this is he re uh, he, he went back to what was called the Italian cantata style mass, which was developed in Naples in the early 17th century. Now, the important thing about this, and again, there are a lot of details, but I, the details are not important, but the one thing you need to know is that what the Italian cantata style mass did was to say that in order to get these ideas to a congregation, you need to have a variety in the presentation. And so instead of just having one Gregorian chant that lasts two hours, <laughs> or worse, how many of you had a priest that droned in Latin and you, know, you, you sort of tuned out at a certain point? And then post-Vatican II, they droned in English. <laughs> and then after they wake you up and give you the wafer and the wine. <laughs> and then you're supposed to walk out of there revived and better. So... The, the cantata style mass said, let's make this into a drama. And so what you had introduced was the most advanced musical tools that were available in the 17th century. Bel canto singing. And so they introduced almost operatic solos. So that, or duets, or sometimes quartets. So that the ideas... Would, would resonate. Then they incorporated polyphony, counterpoint. And people like Palestrina, who wasn't very good, but Palestrina did some of this. He did it all by Fuchs' rules. The rules of counterpoint by Fuchs, where Fuchs basically said, the only kind of counterpoint is by the rules I've made up. So it's sort of like you have the religious rules, and then you have the, the, the counterpoint rules, so you had a, a uh, paint-by-the-numbers mass. <laughs> Now, Bach didn't like that. But Bach went back and took the old liturgy, the old mass, the timeless, eternal idea of the church. And so in his B minor mass, he incorporates solos, duets, quartets, double choruses, sound familiar, and counterpoint. He also demonstrates his facility with a whole new idea of well tempered. Now, he started writing parts of this Mass in 1724, 1726, but he pulled it all together in 1748, the same time he was working on the Art of the Fugue and the incredible counterpoint in the Art of the Fugue. But what he does then is you'll see if, you, and, and I'm not going to play it now because we just don't have the time, but 
Um, I'll give you an example. He starts out with the Kyrie, the, the beginning of the Mass, you know, which we have Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy upon us, and then Christe eleison, Christ have mercy on us. And so Bach in the B minor Mass naturally starts in B minor and has a, a very involved counterpoint for the opening where it's the individual parishioner. It's, it's, it's a Lutheran Protestant type thing. The individual saying, please, Lord, have mercy on us. It's a, an appeal to God from an individual. Then it goes to the Christe Eleison, and he goes to D major. And it's bright and cheery. It, it's no longer a downtrodden, poor sinner begging for mercy. <laughs> It's someone who actually thinks maybe Jesus will have mercy on me. <laughs> I can do something that will, will have him bestow grace upon me. And then it comes back into the repeat of the Kyrie in F sharp minor. And if you think about B, D, and F sharp, you've got the B minor triad. And so there's a unity in it. So you have 17 or 18 minutes where you go from plaintive appeal to enthusiastic recognition of Jesus to a completion of an idea where he's gone through three separate keys which are not separate. Where he's, he's modulated, he's transformed the piece, he's done what he, he did in the well-tempered clavier. Where he demonstrated that you can compose beautiful pieces that are thoroughly motivic composition in all 24 major and minor keys without getting lost or going off into a, a Stravinsky orgasm or something. <laughs> that you can have a coherence in, in the whole musical realm. And this was Bach's drawing upon the work of Kepler because Kepler's work in the harmonies demonstrates that where there are changes that in, in between the equal tempering and well tempering, that there are ways of composing that you can make this coherent. Now this is something I'm sure you've done some work on and I think you should do more work on this question of tempering and the, if you're working on book four, I mean actually it's book five where you get into this question of the intervals, right? So there's a lot there to, to look into. But that's what Bach was doing. And so he writes this mass. Now as he goes further into the mass, he brings in uh, double fugues. He brings in a double chorus. Uh, he, he introduces in uh, the crucifixus, the, the crucifixion. He has a section there where you have the bass line going down chromatically in half steps while there's a voice above it, uh, again appealing, asking that, that your, the sacrifice of Jesus not be in vain. And you have this incredibly powerful emotion that's, he's drawing this out in a congregation. And you, so you have a variety of styles, a variety of compositional methods, but all of it is demonstrating man's command over the harmonies in the musical universe. Telling the story as a drama. And you can imagine in this was never performed in his lifetime. But you can imagine the parts of it. The Kyrie, for example, when it was performed, it was banned. Because they did. They were afraid of what the effect would be on people. In, in one of the kingdoms. He, he wrote it for a king, or a, a duke of Dresden, who converted to Catholicism to become, he wanted to become the king of Poland. He had to be Catholic to be the king of Poland. So that's who Bach wrote it for. And he thought it was too powerful. He didn't want to perform in his kingdom. <laughs> now, so Bach's B minor mass ended up in an attic somewhere. And Bach died. Now, 1781, here comes the young Wolfgang Mozart. Comes into Vienna, pretty much kicked out of Salzburg, trying to make it as a musician. Uh, again, a religious man. Actually, let me just go back to Bach for a moment. There's a, a powerful irony here that you have a Protestant who used the old liturgy of the Catholic Mass to write his 
masterpiece in, in religious music, the B minor mass. There are two other masterpieces he wrote, the, the uh, Passion of St. John and the Passion of uh, St. Matthew's Passion. Uh, but this B minor mass uh, to this day is one of the great works in the history of man. But it's got this irony embedded in it. And I was talking to Lynn about it, and I said, you know, this was not just something that he, he did, you know, for for fun. There was a purpose to it. And I said, I think he was writing this as an intervention into the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. And I, I thought of this when Lynn was talking about Sarpy and Sarpy's role in uh, changing, trying to change science, basically working with the Protestants while you had the Catholics stuck with Aristotle. And so I said, is, is this what Bach was doing, an intervention into both? Because he's showing the Catholics that you have to have this passion, this individual sense of emotion and relationship with God, and then showing the Protestants that it's not about an individual salvation, but it is a social dynamic. It comes through the church. And Lynn said, exactly. And I said, can you elaborate? And he said, no. <laughs> and he said, get people working on this. He told me to work on it, but he said, get other people on it. This is, this is useful. And now, that's when, now we see Mozart come along. Mozart was uh, in Vienna at a time when Joseph II, the emperor, was trying to make some profound changes in the church. Partly, he was trying to get more independence for Austria from the Catholic Church. And so he issued an edict banning Italian-style cantata masses. And the edict actually says, no fugues, <laughs> no counterpoint, <laughs> no solos, and they have to be three to five minutes. <laughs> now, and Coloredo, who is the Archbishop of Salzburg, enthusiastically endorsed this and Colorado actually said the mass must be simple because the people are simple <laughs> now this is how you control a population to keep them stupid so here's Mozart 1781-82 at the home of, of Baron von Sweden <laughs> very important figure and von Sweden had come back from Berlin loaded up with box manuscripts and Handel's manuscripts. And von Sweeten was one of the librarians of the emperor, and he had a salon, and von Sweeten's salon included people like Franz Joseph Haydn, Michael Haydn, it included Salieri. Some of you may know the name Salieri because of the slanders against him in the movie Amadeus. <laughs> and one of the people they invited to come in was the young Mozart. And every Sunday for two hours, they played music. And they played Bach and, Heid and uh, Handel. And Mozart wrote a letter to his father. And he said, this is wonderful. Every Sunday, fugues. We play fugues, Bach fugues. Send me the music you have. Because his father had music. Now, in Bach's time, one of the arguments was that his counterpoint was too complex that it was too old style. He was attacked, and I, I couldn't find, I have a quote from someone who said, it's stale and old and complex. Of course it was complex. He was dealing with a universe that's complex. He's dealing with human minds which are complex, and he's trying to give insights into this relationship between the mind and the physical universe as mediated through musical tones. But there's nothing in the notes themselves. It's in the way the mind moves between the notes where you find creativity. And so Mozart sees this. And the, the young Mozart, who was an impressive, excitable, passionate person, loved it. And his wife loved it. And she said, you must write nothing but fugues, Wolfie. <laughs> so she called him Wolfie. I, I, I doubt that. That was in the Wolf Earl is what they called him. Well. Yeah. So, anyway, <laughs> in the midst of this, Mozart decides to write a mass. Now he'd written a lot of Catholic music because he was he, he was in the pay of the Archbishop of Salzburg. He wrote some Misa Brevis, short masses, 
He'd written some slightly longer ones. But some of it was like program music. You know, he was paid to do it. it, it you can see the Mozart touch, but it's not too much to it. All of a sudden, the edict comes out. No Italian cantata-style masses. Now, it's at that point that he's working on uh, Handel's music, the oratorios, the, the Messiah, and he's working on Bach. And so he writes a mass, which, in, which you guys are singing now, the Mass in C, which incorporates Bachian counterpoint, Handel orchestration. You know, one of the things that Handel did, you see it all over the Messiah, is this dotted rhythm, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, you know, which you, you hear all the time. In French Baroque, that was meant to be the, the signal that the king was entering. <laughs> that was the royal theme. <laughs> and so for Handel, and then later Mozart, the idea is this is the king of kings. <laughs> so you find a lot of that. But if you listen to the orchestration of the C minor mass, you find Handel, you find Bachian counterpoint. We had a perfect example of the singing you were doing today. You find the use of such uh, transitions and modulations as the Lydian interval. In the gratias of the uh, Mass in C, there are so damn many Lydians <laughs> that a non-Lydian interval is a moment of celebration. <laughs> and this is the means, the Lydian interval is the way you, you introduce a, a boundary condition, a change from one key to another. It, it was a, developed especially by Bach and then used by Mozart, including in the Ave Virum Corpus at the end of his life. But the idea is that, again, you're moving through the whole musical universe. You're not bound by laws or keys. You're only bound by the necessity to be seeking truth, to be truthful from the standpoint of uh, man and God and also beautiful. Now, the other thing in Mozart is the operatic nature of the Mass in C. And just imagine this. You're a, a poor burger in Salzburg. Uh, you're in a little hardware store. Or you're, a, you're a dairyman or something. And you come to church on Sunday. All week, you, know, you live with pigs and chickens running in and out of your house. You, you have a, a, a small vocabulary. You don't, no great ideas. And when you go to the church, usually, usually you hear Latin and it means nothing to you. See, this is what one of the things they were dealing with was the problem that afflicts Judaism and Christianity, which is the language of religion was different from the language of the home and the street and the workplace. If you were Jewish, you prayed in Hebrew, which no one spoke. <laughs> and then your home life was Yiddish, the Mamaloshin, the mother tongue, <laughs> which was a mix of about 60 languages. It was called a polyglot or a jargon. <laughs> and then if you were really smart, you learned the language where you lived. But you brought that language into your own home language. If you were a Christian, you grunted maybe 300 to 500 words in your local language. Mm -hmm. Then you go to church and you wouldn't know what the hell they were talking about. They were talking Latin. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons Islam spread was that Islam had a unified language culture. No matter what country it was in, you spoke Arabic, you prayed in Arabic, and Arabic was the language of science. The poetry was Arabic. So, and, and this is what Vatican II in 1906, what was it, 62, Matthew? Finally said, look, let's do the masses in our language so people can understand it. <laughs> you didn't need that because the language of music was universal. So when you listen to the opening of the Mozart Mass in C, and you hear the Kyrie beginning, and then all of a sudden in the Christe Eleison, you have an unbelievably beautiful, angelic soprano voice. And you can imagine the poor person, tired from the day at work and the week's work and you know, dressing up for church and being pissed off and you know, who knows what else is going on, sitting down in the pew thinking about how they can't afford to make a, 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 a donation this week. And all of a sudden, you're lifted up to heaven. Because that's what the, the Christ de Eleison section does. And then as it goes on, you have duets, you have quartets, you have intense counterpoint, and then moments of just joyful jubilation. Now, what was the point 
Mozart was doing his own intervention. But what he was doing was bringing the best music back into the church. And I, I want to give you a sense of this, and I'm going to be just a couple more minutes here. But he wrote a letter to his father in April 1783. And uh, this is my polemic, so pay, pay careful attention. <laughs> he said to his father, when the weather gets warmer, please make a search in the attic under the roof and send us some of your own church music. Now his father was a composer also. He said, you have no reason whatever to be ashamed of it. Baron von Sweeten and Starzer know as well as you and I that musical taste is continually changing. And what is more, that this extends even the church music, which ought not to be the case. Hence it is that true church music is to be found only in attics <laughs> and in worm-eaten condition. So he was basically saying, we don't need this pop church music. <laughs> we don't need simple music for simple people. We need the counterpoint of Bach. We need the great music, which is where you find musical truth. And so when you work through the Mass and C, you're working through a polemic. And what's the polemic? The musician, in the case of Mozart, as in Bach, has a self-conception of having a responsibility to communicate these more powerful and profound ideas to a suffering and demoralized and often weak population to lift them out of the tragedy of their daily life and show them that they can touch the divine through participation in the Mass. Now, this was a, a profound tool that if people in the church were interested in things other than gate receipts, they could have used to really get big gate receipts <laughs> instead of trying to be focused on rules and dogma. Now, the importance of this is what I started with. If you, are, if you recognize that human beings have a higher purpose, and there are mysteries in this. Let me just tell you, I, I'm sure that it's not just that I'm Jewish that I find some of these things mysterious. <laughs> you know, the, the, the idea of the virgin birth <laughs> is a bit of a mystery. <laughs> and you can tell me you have to take it on faith. <laughs> but it's still a little out there. <laughs> now, a lot of what Jesus did, you know, it, it, it's there's you know, walking on water, you know, turning, uh, you know, producing the bread and the fishes and things of that sort. You, you look at his words, his language, his beautiful conceptions about what man should be. And you can see why someone like Kepler a universal genius was attracted to the ideas of Jesus and wanted to be part of a religion that promoted these ideas, not a religion that told you, here are the rules you have to follow to be accepted in the religion. Same thing with Bach. Same thing with Mozart. Same thing with Cusa. You know, Cusa's idea of the peace among the faith is that you have to be open to other approaches to these ideas, provided they're honest and seeking truth. And so these individuals I've talked about were primarily people whose focus in life was truth and outreach. <laughs> Their view was you had to take these ideas out to the poor and the downtrodden and the ignorant and the afflicted and those who need a sense of a purpose in life. And whether they grasp the idea, the mysteries of the the Immaculate Conception and the, the Virgin Birth and, and the Resurrection of Christ. Whether they accept that or believe it or take it on faith, you have to show them something in man that exemplifies this principle of higher truth. And that's the power of this kind of creativity in music. That's the power in working through hour after hour a problem in Kepler and suddenly seeing what it was that Kepler saw. And then taking that out to other people who need that. You know, in this day and time, the, the fight to continue the work of Cusa and Kepler and Mozart and Bach 
We do the science work, we do the music work, but we don't do them as things in themselves. We do them to improve our powers of cognition, but at the same time to improve our powers of communication, communication of profound ideas. And that's why if you saw something that I saw today, from sitting up in front, watching the faces of people, watching the chorus, I don't think they knew what was coming, most of the people there. And they're watching. And you could see changes in the expressions. Those of you who were sitting in the audience saw the change in, in Counselor Turner. He started out, he was looking at his notes, and then, then he sort of looked up, and toward the end he was going like this. <laughs> he was watching Mihua conduct. And when as she was, he was moving. I mean, what did he say? What did he say? Here's a guy who you might expect to say, well, thank you for the introduction with dead white men's culture. <laughs> Not only did he say that, he thanked, he thanked the LaRouche Youth Movement for this wonderful presentation. He said music is something that moves us. And it moves us on that basis, that higher basis. It, it touches the human. The human quality that exists in everyone. But it only touches it if you take it out. Now, each of us in our organizing has to exemplify that. That's why we sing. You know, maybe a few people here have good enough voices that, that you'll be able to sing before large audiences and move them. Most of us don't. As a violinist, I, I know that if, if I play second fiddle and I have a good first violin next to me, people won't hear my mistakes as much. <laughs> but I, I put my passion into it because I want to communicate the idea and move people with these ideas. And if we're not out organizing with these ideas, if we're sitting up perfecting ourselves, we're like the manuscripts in the attic that are sitting and gathering dust in worm-eaten covers. <laughs> And instead, we have to be that living force that, that moves people. And you take that to this particular situation that we have now, with the potential to move the country, a president that's capable of being moved, a population that wants to be moved and has every crazy idea in the book. <laughs> you know, the Tesla fanatics are coming running out from every door. It's, it's almost like Jonathan Swift's special, um, um, what is it, Laputa, where they're trying to extract sunbeams from cucumbers. <laughs> you know, this is what we're dealing with, a population that doesn't know how to find truth with a flashlight and a map. <laughs> now, we can't just tell them this is true. We have to inspire in them and incite in them those qualities of humanity that will give them the confidence that they can go out and discover truth. And what I'd like to do is, actually, we should just move on. And maybe at the end, we can sing again. And, or, do we have time to sing that? Yeah. 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 All right, let's, I, I, for those who didn't hear it, I'd like the chorus to come up here and sing what you did from the Mozart Mass today to give a sense of an extremely complex piece that brings these ideas out. And see if it doesn't make you feel better when you listen to it. <laughs>